Well, we're so happy today to have our evangelist. This is our evangelist. Tim Lee is our evangelist. He came here the first year that I came, which was way back in 1991 when we had 60-something people. He came and spoke here. And he's been coming practically every year since 1991. He preaches all over the world. He, as I said, he gave his legs for his country. God did a work in his heart in Vietnam. And God is using him to see just myriads of people saved. We're happy today to have our friend and our evangelist, Tim Lee, here with us speaking. Let him know how happy we are to have Tim and his wife, Connie. Connie, raise your hand. Connie's right back here, and she's here with us. God bless you, bud. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Take your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. I should have given you enough time to found it right there. If you haven't found it by now, go to the front of your book, the Bible. There's a page there that lists all the books of your Bible. That's there for two reasons. For those who just recently got saved and they don't have a clue where anything's at. That's the way you were. But when you got saved, you thought Job was Job. You thought Psalms was palms. And then um, it's also there for those of us who are well over 50. We know it's in there, but sometimes we just have trouble finding it. It is so good to be back at Marcus Point. It truly is one of our favorite places to come. I'm, I'm not just saying that. God knows my heart. I love coming to Marcus Point Baptist Church. I love your pastor and his wife and their children, their family. They've been good friends of mine for many years. Your pastor serves on the board of Timley Ministries and uh, has been a dear, dear friend and helped us out so many, many times over the years. And I appreciate him. We've, we've, been, we've been around the world together. We went to India a few years ago and one of the most grueling, one of the roughest trips I've ever been on in my life. And, um, but we saw thousands and thousands come to Christ. Your pastor spoke to several hundred pastors there, uh, him and Jerry Walls, and, uh, and we have these evening services, and they would come in for miles and miles and miles around. But, um, but he told me, he said, it's a one-time deal. Don't ask me to go back. That's it. And so... But he, your pastor was a warrior, man. I'm telling you, we, uh, we did it. So thank you for letting me come back to Marcus Point. It's always a, a joy and an honor. And uh, so this morning, this morning, there's a little bit of an unusual message. I even wrestled with the Lord about it. And, uh, but the Lord always wins out, of course. And uh, so I'm, I'm speaking to you from the Old Testament. Most times on Sunday morning, I'm speaking from the New Testament and basically a salvation message. I'm going to preach the gospel this morning and tell people how they can be saved. But, but the message today is pretty strong for the church. The message today is pretty strong for believers. So I want you to open your heart and your mind and ask God uh, to say something to you. If I was to title my message this morning, I would title it two short words. I was. Past tense. I was. Let me begin reading in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse number 1. I'm welcome to our locations at Beulah and uh, North Pace. And I, I appreciate what God's doing here. This church is not sitting on its laurels. This church has accomplished so much over the years, but still growing and still reaching out and still got a vision and a burden and lots of times when a pastor's been in the church for a while, he begins to lose his energy and his excitement. He just kind of has a maintenance ministry, just maintain. But that's not your pastor at all. Your pastor is so driven by wanting to see people saved. I don't know how many we've seen baptized today. Maybe close to 20 people baptized here today. And, and I told the first service, last year there were 6,000 Baptist churches that never saw one person baptized. You would think the pastors could have led one person to the Lord in 365 days and got them to come and follow the Lord in baptism. Over 6,000 
Never saw one single person baptized. And your church has saw 18 today, 19, maybe 20. And, and my, my goodness, you, I hope you don't ever take that for granted. Amen. And uh, so welcome Beulah and North Pace. Let me begin reading at verse number one. Are you ready? Here we go. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Cheslu, the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, the Hanai, one of my brethren, some theologians believe he's actually one of his blood brothers, the Hanai, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews had had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, I want you to get the picture. This man, Nehemiah. Nehemiah is not a prophet. He's not a preacher. He's not a priest. He's a layman. Now, I want you to get that in your mind today. He's, he's a layman. And this layman, after he hears a message, is going to do in 52 days what has not been done in 141 years. With the help of God, he's going to do it in 52 days. Wow. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king. This is a trustworthy position. This means the, this means the king trusts him. That, that he would trust Nehemiah with his life. That's the kind of position that he has now. Actually, Nehemiah is a slave. But if you're going to be a slave, this is the kind of slave position that you would want to have. Instead of being out in a hot field of hard labor from sunup to sundown, he's in the palace. He's affiliated with the highest authority in the land. He has job security. There's no problems in Nehemiah's life until this day. On this day, a message comes to Nehemiah that is going to turn his life upside down. Have you ever heard a message that turned your life upside down? I'm not talking about when you got saved. Of course, that changed your life forever, off the road to hell and on the road to heaven. Hope you don't ever get over that. That's something to sing about and shout about and get excited about. If you've been saved for 50 years or more, you ought to still get excited about it as well as when you first got saved. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about since you got saved, has there been a message that you heard that God used that message to turn your life upside down? Well, this is what happens to Nehemiah. He hears a message that turns his life upside down. Well, man alive, Tim, that must have been one powerful message. That must have been that must have been so exciting. That must have been so dramatic. That must have been so powerful and, 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 so, and so uplifting and so encouraging and so motivational. No, it wasn't any of that at all. As a matter of fact, it was a message of gloom and doom. It was a message of destruction. It was a very pessimistic message. Well, what's the message, Tim? Well, we just read it, but let's read it again. Verse number three, chapter one, Nehemiah, and they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. There's not a positive word in verse number three. It's a hard message. Today we clamor for preachers to tell us something good about ourselves. 
pat us on the back, stroke our ego, make us feel great, give us positive stuff. And I agree, there's a there's times when pastors need to be encouraging and motivational and, and uplifting and maybe some pats on the back. But I'm going to tell you there's also times when the preacher needs to get in the pulpit and preach it like it is to people the way they are without fear and without favor to anyone in the room. Amen. Everyone needs that. I need that kind of preaching and you need that kind of preaching. How does Nehemiah respond to this message? Well, let me tell you what he could have done before we see how he responds. He could have gotten angry. He could have gotten real mad. He, he, he could have looked at these guys and said, look, you know, I wanted to report, but man, you're loading this stuff on me, and, and this is so heavy, and this so hard, so difficult. I, I'm in the king's palace. I'm a slave. What do you expect me to do about this? Why are you telling me this stuff for? He could have gotten very angry. That's the way a lot of Christians are when they hear the truth. When the preacher does tell them the truth, they get angry. Angry at the messenger, angry at the message. Why are you telling me this stuff for? They just like to keep their head buried in the sand and pretend that everything's okay. Let me suggest to you that he could have reacted another way. He could have been... He could have been a little more passive about it. He could have said to those guys, well, look, man, thank you for telling me the truth, but you know, I'm a slave and I can't leave the palace. And, 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 but I tell you what, if you will go do something about it, I'll pray for you while you go. That's a mess. That's, a, that's, a, that's what a lot, the response of a lot of Christians in America today. I, I'm not going to get my hands dirty and I'm not going to get my feet wet. But if you go do something about the problem, I'll pray for you. But that's not how Nehemiah responds. Look at verse number four. And it came to pass when I heard these words. The words of affliction, reproach, walls broken down, gates burned with fire. When I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This message is so strong. This message is so powerful. This message is so great. Nehemiah cannot even remain standing. He has to sit down. And when he sits down, he begins to weep, and he begins to mourn, and he begins to fast, and he begins to pray. And the Bible says, for certain days. This isn't a five-minute trip to the altar. Unless you misunderstand me, I'm not against five-minute trips to the altar. I believe we all need five-minute trips to the altar. Some of you have been saved for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you haven't been back to the altar since you got saved. There's no one in this room right now that is so right with God that you haven't needed to be at an altar in the last five years. You're kidding yourself. But I'm not talking about that. And, and, and by the way, that's the starting place, folks. A five-minute trip to the altar is a starting place. It doesn't end it. It's the beginning of God doing something in your life. For Nehemiah, this message has now got a hold of him, and it won't let go. This message has convicted him. This message is so strong, and he's so broken, and he's so burdened, he's weeping. What's he weeping over? He's, we he's weeping over his city. He's weeping over his people. He's weeping over Jerusalem and the destruction that has come. He's so moved and so burdened. When's the last time you wept over America? When's the last time you wept over your city? When's the last time that you spent certain days praying and, and fasting and burdened over your city and over your country? When we look around at America today and we see destruction on every side. We see sin running rampant. We see a, a nation that doesn't have leaders with courage and backbone to stand. And, I'm, and I, this is not the America that I want for my children and for my grandchildren. This is not the America that was handed to me by my, by my parents and my grandparents. 
I've said so many times that America is worth fighting for. America is worth standing for. And if needs be, America we're dying for. I'm motivated. I'm encouraged by what's happening in Ukraine today. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know, I don't know what's going to be the end deal. But I will tell you this. They've got a leader. They've got someone that's not afraid. To, the, our government offered to come and get him out and fly his family to safety. And he said, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. Now, I'm not saying he's the perfect guy. I know I think he's done some bad stuff himself. I'm not saying that, but right now, you know what he's fighting for? Freedom for his people. I'm for anyone who wants freedom. So we're gonna now go to let's let's continue the, the prayer of Nehemiah. Go to verse number six. Well, well. We, we read verse number four, and it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And he continues his prayer in verse five and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Verse six, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night, for again it's consumed him. Day and night, for the children of Israel, thy sins and, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. And the key word in verse number six for our message this morning is the little word I. Nehemiah says I have sinned. Now, wait a minute. What's Nehemiah been doing so bad? Has he been out getting drunk? Has he been out blaspheming God, cursing God? No. He didn't doing any of that. What's he been doing so bad? Well, see, that's the problem. He hasn't been doing anything. He, he's in the king's palace. Everything's fine in his life. He's got job security, he affiliates with the highest authority in the land. Everything is fine. You understand that many times the sins of omission can be as great, if not greater, than the sins of commission? We know what's wrong with the drunkard and the prostitute. We know what's wrong with the homosexual. We know what's wrong with the pornographers. We know what's wrong with the abortionists. We know what's wrong with liberal politicians. But watch out when it comes to self. Nehemiah says, I have sinned. And man, when you begin to confess your own sin, the black people of America used to sing an old spiritual. They sang, it's me, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O Lord. We Baptists, we don't sing it like that. We sing, it's them, it's them, it's them, oh Lord. Boy, if they would just confess their sins. Boy, if they just get right with God. Boy, if they just go to the altar, we could have revival. But that's not the way it works, people. It starts with I. It starts with self. When's the last time you had a real good heart examination? I'm not talking about from your cardiologist. I'm talking about you and God. And God looking at you and, and God, you're allowing God to put his finger on these areas of your life and, and you begin to get under conviction and you begin to realize and maybe you're not out in deep sin and, and, and doing horrible things, but maybe your prayer life has suffered. Maybe your Bible reading has suffered. Maybe your church attendance has slipped. Maybe your giving has, has, has gone by the wayside. Maybe you're not witnessing the way you used to witness. I don't know, but God begins to put his finger on these areas of your life. When he does, conviction comes. And you can do a couple of things. You can either ignore it or you can deal with it. And if you deal with it, it's going to bring change. People are going to know there's change. Something's going to happen in your life. It's not going to be status quo anymore. It's not going to be like it was. Now, some of you are uncomfortable right now, but I'm preaching about this, and it's bringing conviction. 
You say, we don't need a preacher from Texas coming here to rock our boat. I didn't come here to rock your boat. I came here to turn it over. (laughs) We've had status quo. We've had it going easy. We've done it. We're in the palace. Everything's great. Everything's good. Leave me alone. I don't want to leave you alone. I want to bother you. I wanted to concern you today. Now understand that we're in trouble and there's no, there's no hope for America in Washington, D.C. There's no hope for America in the Democrat Party or the Republican Party. I believe you ought to vote. I believe you ought to be registered to vote. I believe you ought to vote. Don't tell me how much you love America if you won't vote. But, but my friend, voting's not going to bring America back to God. You getting under conviction in your life and you begin to get a burden for God to do something in your heart, in your life, and your family, and your church, and your community, and God begins to do that work and a fire begins to burn. Now, let's look. Let's look at the conditions. Go, go back if you would. We just read verse 6, let's read verse 7. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Verse number 9, and he gives another if. He says, but if, thank God for this if, But if ye turn unto me, the little word if is a conditional word. Where else do we find that little word if? We find it in the matter of salvation. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved if. We find it in the matter of a backslider. 1 John 1, 9, if We confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If the condition for revival, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Well, we know that was written for Israel. We understand that. But I got news for you, friend. There are a lot of things that God said to Israel that if we paid attention to it, it would help us a lot. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If... My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And then most of the time we stop. We don't mind those first three things. Humble, pray, seek. It's the fourth one that gets us. And turn from their wicked ways. Who turned from their wicked ways? The abortionist? No. The pornographer? No. The, the, the drug addict? No. Who turned from their wicked ways? He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. How many of you agree today that America is in need of healing? America needs revival. America needs to hear from God. America needs to repent. We need forgiveness of our sins. He says, if you turn, if we turn today, instead of judgment, we can find mercy. We can find grace and compassion and and we know that we deserve judgment America deserves the judgment of God today in many ways I believe that judgment is already here but also believe that mercy and grace is is possible if we will repent if we will obey God and do what God wants us to do we can see mercy if ye turn Now, I want you to go to the last verse of chapter 1. And this is where I find the title for our message this morning. Oh, Lord, I beseech thee, Nehemiah, he's still praying. 
Nehemiah's praying. He'd been praying a lot. And Oswald Chambers said that, that prayer does not lead us to the greater work. He said prayer is the greater work. Wow. So everybody can do this work. Children can pray, teenagers can pray, adults can pray, grandma and grandpa can pray, all of us can pray, and we should be. He said, let now thine ear be attended to the prayer of thy servant, to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name, and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. In the sight of what man? In the sight of the king, his boss the one that can do whatever he wants to do with Nehemiah. He can snap his fingers, have Nehemiah put to death. He's the king. Nehemiah's a slave. And then look at the last sentence in verse number 11. For I was, I was, I was the king's cupbearer. Why? Why does he say it? in the past tense. Why does he say, I was the king's cupbearer? He's getting ready to resign. (laughs) That's kind of funny. How do you resign being a slave? Huh? Well, you really don't yourself. God has to do that for you. And the old time preacher used to say, where the Lord guides, the Lord provides. So if God's going to call you to do something, he's going to give you a way to do it. Now get the picture. Nehemiah's heard this message. It's got a hold of him. It won't let go. Nehemiah has confessed his own sins. Nehemiah's gotten his own heart and his own life right with God. And he's heard this message. And now he says, I was the king's cupbearer. So he's resigning He's leaving being a slave. Where's he going to go? Man, this must, if he's already in the king's palace, this must be a, a little bit of even a better position than, than being a cupbearer to the king. Where's he going to go? He's going to Jerusalem. And what's in Jerusalem? Broken walls, burned gates, a people in affliction and reproach. Hey! Nehemiah has now come to the place in his life where he's not only heard the word of God, but he's now decided to do something about it. It's one thing to hear the message and say amen and agree with what's being said, but it's another thing when you leave the building to go do something about it. We are the most preached to generation there's ever been in America. We hear more preaching than any other generation before us. You can turn on your radio, your television, 24 hours a day, you can hear preaching. Some of us crazy. Sometimes I can't sleep, I turn the television on three o'clock in the morning and there's a and there's a, there's a preacher on there telling me if I send him $1,000, if I'll plant this seed of $1,000, it's always $1,000. I don't know how they come up with that magical number, but it's always 1000 And I'm talking back to the TV, and I'm saying, hey, bud, why don't you send me $1,000 to plant your own seed? I talked to him. One of them guys the other day said, if you'll put your hand on the television when I pray, ye shall receive the power. I said, you put your hand in the back of that television, you shall really receive the power. (laughs) But our problem is not hearing the word. Our problem is doing something about it after we hear it. And I want to say something this morning Marcus point that, I, I, and I, I'm, 
I wouldn't hurt you for anything, but you need to listen to this. I don't believe it bothers the devil a whole lot what we do at church. I really don't. We come to church and we can shout and sing and pray and give and weep and preach and all that's great and all that's wonderful. But if we don't do something about it, when we leave the doors of the building, then the devil hasn't been bothered by what we did at the building. So we got to wake up. You say, well, Tim, I'm just one person. I'm tired of hearing Christians say that. I'm just one. You and God make a majority. Nehemiah was only one man. And we don't have time to read it today, but I want you, if you, you want to do a little Bible study off the beat from what you may be doing already this week, just take a little extra time, read Nehemiah. Read it off if you want to, but read especially chapters one through eight. You'll find out what happens before revival comes. You'll find out what happens when revival comes. You'll find out what happens after revival comes. It is the greatest book in the Bible about revival. And God used one man. One man. Madeline Murrow Hare was one woman. My generation, those of you old enough in this room, remember Madeline Murrow Hare. She was a little bit crazy. She was an atheist. And she would debate people and she'd make money off of it. She wasn't very smart, but she was crazy. But she took her son, her, she took her son, Bill Murray, all the way to the Supreme Court, one woman, to get Bibles and prayers kicked out of our public schools. One woman. I'm sitting on an airplane, and I look at this guy across the aisle, and he looks familiar. And then I look, I, I, when, I, when it was appropriate and no one was going to bother us, I, I started a conversation with him. I, I said, what is your name? And he told me his name was Bill Murray. This is Bill Murray that his mom used to go to the Supreme Court to get Bible's prayers. Bill Murray is now a Christian. Bill Murray is now a believer. Bill Murray is an evangelist. Bill Murray is out traveling and preaching, trying to undo the damage that his mom did to America. And I looked at him, and I, I, I was so interested in him. I, I said, well, when, when you got saved, when you became a Christian, how, how did your mom treat you? And now we've been having a good conversation. He's been smiling a little bit and talking and everything fine. But now all of a sudden, it, it, his whole disposition changed. And he was so sad and he bowed his head. He said, my mom treats me as though I'm dead. Can you imagine that? Your mom's such an atheist that she hates her own son? I said, well, how about your, your children, her grandchildren? He said the same thing. She treats them as though they're dead. She died a violent death. Along with at least one, maybe two of her grandchildren. Horrible death. But you think that one woman could do all that damage? There's two things that I point back in America it's in my lifetime that has brought such a shame and reproach that, that, that I believe it caused America to begin to turn on God. Two things, two events, and both of them had to do with the Supreme Court. It was Bibles and prayers out of our schools and abortion. Those two things have brought such a shame and reproach, and we've turned our back. We've kicked God out of everything. Oh, somebody's got to get a burden with me today. Somebody's got to leave here weeping and mourning and praying and fasting over America, over your city, over your town, over your homes, over your church. You got to get a burden. Some of you in your Christian life, you've just been coasting. It's been taking it easy. A man came to me after the first service with tears and said, That's exactly what I've been doing. He said, I've been taking it easy. I said, well, it's not too late. And he said, I know what, I'm going to start doing something. And other than just sitting in a seat on Sunday morning and singing a few songs, that's not the Christian life, people. That's worship. But that's not service. There's a place of service for you here. That makes some of you uncomfortable because you just want to sit in your seat and take it easy and coast along. That's not it. 
I was the king's cupbearer. So there's a couple of cars in the garage. There's three television sets in your house. You've got two or three weeks of paid vacation a year. Everything's fine. No, everything's not fine. Our families are in trouble. Our churches, our neighborhoods, our towns, our country, our world. This whole world needs Jesus. Who's going to give them Jesus if you won't? Hmm? You're going to send a missionary around the world to witness and win lost people halfway around the world, but you won't walk across the street and invite your neighbor to come to church? Invite your neighbor to come to Easter sunrise? Service? I've seen this sunrise. I've heard about this for years. Folks. This is a big deal. One of the greatest one of the greatest Easter services in America, not just Florida, in America. And people come by the thousands. And, and this, is a, this is a big deal. Your pastor with a vision and a burden and leadership. And they're setting this up. It takes a lot. And now they don't want just Pensacola in the surrounding area. They want it to go to the world. Well, that takes money. I like this deal, this Baptist pastor. I like my Baptist pastor free. And he's giving money away. He's not asking it. He's giving it away. That's a miracle. <laughs> but you see, I know, what's, I know what some of you are going to do. You're going to sit on it, and you're not going to use it. And God's given you an opportunity. I've seen people do this. I've watched those shows where they take a dollar or five dollars, and they'll buy something at a swap shop, flea market, and they'll sell it for $10, and they'll take that $10, and they'll buy a $20, and $20, they'll buy a $100 deal, and they trade it, and they go on up. And, and then after a while, they got a car or a boat or something. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but I'm going to tell you, you ought to begin to dream right now. You ought to begin to think right now, what can I do to be a part of this? I don't want that money just to set in my pocket. I want God to use it in order to buy airtime and send this message across the world. Amen. So, Nehemiah, oh, this is such a great story. I, I, I'm not going to preach it today. I normally would go to chapter 2, but we're not going to do it today. But chapter number 2 is such an exciting chapter. Nehemiah, just to paraphrase, goes down to look at goes down to look at Jerusalem, and it's even worse than Hanai and the brother told him. It's horrible. And, but he's not discouraged. And, and the king, the king, he talks to the king. He has to have this conversation. It's uncomfortable. And he comes into the king's presence, and the king can detect immediately that something is wrong. Because Nehemiah is normally a happy guy. You read in chapter number two, he normally got a good attitude, a great spirit. I like to be around people like that. I like to be around fun people. Your pastor's a fun guy. I like to be around fun. He's serious when he needs to be serious. We've cried together and wept together and prayed together, but we've also laughed together. We've had fun together and exciting time. I don't like to be around people all the time complaining and griping and belly aching. They never see the glass half full. They don't even see water in it at all. Did you ever ask somebody how they were doing and they told you? <laughs> Folks, it's a figure of speech. We don't want your medical history. Now, I'm not talking about someone that's been in a terrible accident or somebody's had a horrible disease. I'm talking about somebody, well, I stumped my toe. You know what I tell them? Be glad you got one to stump. How's that working for you? Amen? But they're always complaining and growling. No, Nehemiah wasn't that guy. Nehemiah was a happy slave. He was a joyful slave. And we are servants. Paul calls himself a bondservant, a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can even be a happy slave or you can be a miserable slave. There's a lot of people who are miserable and they like for everyone else around them to be miserable. Some people brighten up the room when they leave it. I like to be around that person. And Nehemiah, now the king notices something's wrong. See, Nehemiah's been praying. He's for chapter 1, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 1, four months have gone by. And what's he been doing, doing for four months? He's been praying. He's weeping and he's mourning and he's fasting and he's burdened. A message got a hold of him. And so the king can see it. And the king said, why the sadness? And Nehemiah said, well, why shouldn't I be sad? The place of 
My father's sepulchers are ruined. My city's ruined. The walls are gone. The gates are burned. The people are hurting. Why shouldn't I be sad? There is a time to there is a time to have a feast. There's a time for Thanksgiving. There's a time for us to celebrate. There's a time to laugh, but there's also a time to cry and a time to weep and a time to mourn and a time to pray and get burdened about things. Now's that time. Amen. Nehemiah, the king is going to let him go. He's not going to just let him go. He's going to bless him. God's going to use a heathen king to meet the needs of Nehemiah. He's going to give him a letter from, to give to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, so he can have all the lumber and timber he needs to rebuild the walls and the gates. He's going to give him another letter of authority so that anybody he comes into contact with, all these, and they say, well, what are you doing? What are you out here for? Why aren't you... Being that slave you're supposed to be. And all he's got to do is show him the letter and, and says, the king has given me the permission. He had authority. Look up here today, folks. We've got a letter of authority. It's the word of God. We go in Jesus' name. And he didn't only give him the supplies, the provisions, and the, not only the, the power, but he gave, he gave him protection. He sent some of the king's army and some of the soldiers to protect him. We live in a mean old world. This world hates us. The world doesn't love your God. The world doesn't love your Jesus. The world doesn't love your Bible. There are people in this world that would just as soon chop your head off of your shoulders than to hear you say the name Jesus. You stand strong and you stand boldly. And just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Lord will be with you. And you just like Daniel and the lion's den, the Lord will be with you. But you got to have faith and you got to stand. You got to be involved. You got to be strong. You got to go in Jesus' name. A couple of young men came up to me afterwards, Pastor. I'm assuming they're, I'm looking at them. They're 19, 20, 21 years old. Good looking young men. They come to me and said, We believe God's calling us to preach. And, and, and you know what I told them? I said, Now, boys, let me tell you what we're needing in the ministry. We need pastors and evangelists and missionaries. We don't need ponies. We need some stallions. We need some real men with courage and backbones and guts. We don't need a bunch of sissies in the pulpit. We need some real men of God. You call it toxic masculinity all you want to. I'm tired of seeing our men being turned into sissies and our boys turned into girls. God made two genders and that's a man and a woman. A man's supposed to act like a man and a woman's supposed to act like a woman. So give us some stallions. You're saved today. All I'm asking you to get a little bit of this burden. Leave here today. Take your five-minute trip to the altar, but don't let it stop there. America's worth fighting for. America's worth standing for. America's worth getting involved over for the sake of your children and your grandchildren. But if you've never been saved, if you've never been born in the family of God, you're not going to do God much good. You're not going to do your country much good in a lost condition. And this, and this is another, I was. I was. I was once blind. I was once lost. But now I'm found. And now I see. There's only one way. For you to be found, there's only one way to, for you to see. It's called amazing grace. God's amazing grace. 